I want to thank my good friend. Uh, we work on so many projects, David Jones. David introduced me to Ryan, and I'd been telling David for a, a year or two that when Ryan got back from Afghanistan that we needed to get him to speak first to the Asia Society Texas Center before anyone else grabbed him. So when I learned that you, our friends, were coming here to Texas, I told Ryan this earlier, I thought well, who would be the very best, strongest speaker to impress all of you? And of course, President Bush wasn't available. Uh, Jim Baker was in Africa, I think on another hunting trip. I'm not certain he told me. But right after that, there could be no one bigger or better or more important or more appropriate than Ambassador Ryan Crocker. He is truly a, he is a distinguished American diplomat. He has received, uh, he's a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, he was called by Secretary of State Colin Powell, one of our very best Foreign Service officers ever. And General David Pateras uh, said that he, it was a great honor for General uh, Pateras, Petraeus, excuse me, Petraeus, for him to be uh, Ambassador Crocker's military wingman. We're fortunate to have him here in the Houston region, not far from here, because he has returned uh, as Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. When I say he returned, because he was serving quite happily in that position until the President of the United States, President Obama, called upon him to return to public service and become the U.S. Ambassador again to Afghanistan. Right after 9-11 and after the defeat of the Taliban, he became our envoy to, our first envoy to Pakistan, but then President Obama called upon him to become the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan, which he served until 2012. Um, he's also held a number of important positions. I'm only going to mention them so to stimulate you because in a little while we're going to have a, a Q&A session. Uh, he served as American Ambassador to Pakistan, Kuwait, and Lebanon. It was President George W. Bush, maybe he saw one of my favorite movies, who called Ambassador Crocker America's Lawrence of Arabia. But I don't know whether he had you in the right area uh, of, of the world or not, but uh, nevertheless, I think that was a nice title. Uh, he's, he's received numerous awards and recognition and I could go on and on, and, uh, but instead of me taking up his time, I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Ambassador Crocker. Thank you all. Um, Thank you all. Please, uh, please be seated. Um, if you had um, waited until after my remarks, you wouldn't be standing. It's a, um, uh, Charles, thank you for that very generous introduction, um, uh, which was only slightly longer than my remarks will be. Uh, uh, Charles' guidance for me this evening was keep it short. Uh -huh. Um, and um, I will endeavor to do that. First, let me just say how uh, proud and indeed humbled I am uh, to be here uh, at the uh, Asia Society in this magnificent building, which itself is a tribute, uh, because it is the only uh, freestanding building, as I understand it, uh, uh, that was designed by a renowned uh, Japanese architect. Uh, uh, I am doubly humbled to be here with the global trustees of this great organization. Um, and one of the reasons I'm going to keep my remarks short is the less I say, uh, probably the less uh, silly I will look among people who know the region so much better than I. Um, you know, in addition to reconnecting with my friends, uh, uh, Charles and, and David Jones, uh, uh, I am delighted to have had the chance to connect to uh, uh, Henrietta Four, who as Under Secretary of Management sent me to many of those horrible places. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and uh, Josette Sheeran, uh, also an Undersecretary of State um, for, for Economic Affairs as we tried to wrestle with the U.S.-Pakistani economic relationship with some success. Um, I was asked to speak a bit about diplomacy in the 21st century and the role for organizations uh, such as the Asia Society. Uh, there are just a couple of points I, I would like to make. And again, as I look around this very distinguished assembly, uh, individuals such as um, Henrietta and Josette, who have served at high levels with distinction. Um, the Asia Society, from an American perspective, I think I can say with some level of confidence, knows more about Asia and the interlocking dynamics between Asia and the West, particularly the US, than any other organization. Uh, and as Josette said, uh, we're not going to get much done in the world uh, if we're not able to work cooperatively and productively with Asia. So the first thing I would say, uh, in addition to the very important role all of you play in educating Americans about why our Asian relationships are important, uh, it is crucial that you play that same role in educating administrations. Uh, what, what I would like to see are more members of the Asia Society moving into government, not just the US government, um, but, but governments elsewhere as appropriate, uh, where you can bring your expertise, uh, the weight, the vision, the knowledge of the Asia Society into the policy realm. And I, I would just ask that you think about that. Um, the, the second thing I would say, since my area of expertise is, um, is Western Asia, um, you know, I've never served farther east than, uh, than Pakistan, although I am getting on a plane tomorrow to go to India. Uh, um, one keeps one's hand in. <laughs> um, is to consider how, without diminishing in any way your focus on East Asia, which is so critical, um, that you look for ways to be more engaged uh, in, in Western Asia, which desperately needs your help. Um, as Charles and I will talk about later and we'll get into in, in Q&A, um, uh, that, that you think of Asia broadly uh, uh, to include the Middle East. Uh, because again, the, you know, the learning, the expertise, the advice, the publications uh, that you have brought to Central and East Asia tell me what a role you have to play in all of Asia. And the third thing I'd just like to say, um, from, from my perspective, what makes this society, its leadership and its membership so special, is your understanding that to really grasp the realities of another part of the world, you can't stop with just history and politics. They are essential, they are necessary, they are not sufficient. And the emphasis that the Asia Society has placed on culture, literature, music, makes you absolutely unique among major organizations uh, focused on foreign affairs in this country. No one does what you do. I, I think it was just recently in New York, for example, you, uh, uh, you had a program on Muslim culture. Uh, you know, a lot of Americans think Muslim culture consists of Kalashnikovs. Uh, uh, you demonstrated how rich and deep that is. You know, I, I tell my students, particularly those who are headed for the Foreign Service, um, 
I'm an English major. Um, not even a recovering English major. I'm, I'm still proud of it. Uh, but I, I, I tell my students, uh, if you're going to serve effectively uh, in the world, you have to know language. Uh, you've got to be able to communicate with the people uh, in the country to which you're assigned in their own language. Uh, you've got to know their art. Uh, you've got to know their literature. The Arab world has a very strong poetic tradition that we are completely ignorant of. Um, any educated Arab can quote stanza after stanza of modern and classical Arabic poetry. It's part of who they are. Uh, we have to understand that. Uh, you go a huge way to bring that knowledge and make it available to uh, Americans who otherwise would have no connection to it. Uh, and again, you can know all the history. Actually, we're not very good at that either. Um, you can know the politics. Maybe we're a little bit better. But if you don't know the culture, you will not understand the environment in which you're trying to affect policy. And you do that better than any other organization in this country. Thank you. Um, I'm about to get the hook from Charles. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just set a couple of uh, framing remarks. Uh, you know, on the on the Middle East. Um, you know, thank you, uh, Charles and Josette Henrietta, for your generous remarks. But here's the reality. I think I mentioned this to several of you. If you could imagine a photograph that captured every significant setback to US interests in the broader Middle East since the Iranian Revolution of 1979 uh, and the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. If you could just imagine a picture for every one of those setbacks, I would be in every picture. You know, <laughs> first row, second from the left. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm, you know, again, humbled by this distinguished audience. I am also humbled when I look at the broader Middle East um, and see the challenges that they and we face. And in places like Syria, they're beyond challenges or horrors. Um, uh, you know, I often feel we're moving backwards, not forward, not just as a country or a government, uh, but as an international community. Um, there are lots of reasons for that. Charles will draw some of them out. Others of you will, will have questions. Um, uh, there is a long, tough legacy. Uh, problems such as uh, the war in Syria, uh, the coup and the election, the coup and whatever is coming next in Egypt, uh, these are not the creations uh, of the last couple of years. These were decades in the making and they will take decades to resolve. Um, uh, they will take our strategic patience, our attention, and our focus. We're not really great at strategic patience or long-term attention or sustained focus. Uh, but if we want to see something other than a Middle East that is an ongoing source of instability and threat to our national security interests, uh, we're going to have to come up with it, and I do not see it there now. Uh, so that would be my next to final point. Um, uh, this is something the Asia Society can do um, to bring to the attention of policymakers, since we have policymakers uh, uh, in the room, why this is important, why it counts. Um, we're moving in the direction of a, a quasi-neo-isolationism that I think should scare most of us. Um, it isn't going to be the isolationism after World War I. We'll never go there again. We can't. I mean, economically, we can't. Uh, politically, we'd better not. Uh, but I do worry about that drift. And I do think this society, more than any think tank, any other 
private organization I can imagine uh, has the horsepower, the wattage, the ability to ensure that administrations don't forget what's at stake here. And again, this really is the last thing. Don't worry, Charles. This is, this is it. Um, uh, one example of your engagement um, uh, was your effort to engage Iran's new president. Um, kind of the Q&A you did with uh, President Rouhani um, and while we're at it, I mean, about the same time frame, a man who could be the next uh, president of Afghanistan, uh, Zalmi Rasul, uh, brings these issues to the fore. Um, uh, I just ask that uh, we all look for ways to see that your voices, your educated and informed opinion is heard first in our nation's capital, but also in the capitals of our Asian partners. Uh, this is a critical time. Uh, 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> I, I sit on the board of another uh, distinguished uh, institution and international NGO, Mercy Corps. Many of you know of it. Uh, we are very heavily engaged uh, on the Syrian issue, uh, delivering assistance inside Syria. Uh, I was just at a board meeting when we figured out how we handle that in ways that sure accountability, uh, that aid gets to the right recipients, and the people in Syria who are delivering it don't get themselves killed in a noble cause. Uh, we're engaged in Lebanon. We're engaged in Jordan. We're engaged in Iraq. We're engaged in Turkey with helping with refugee flows. Um, I would hope uh, that at a time when it isn't going to get any more stable out there, uh, that we look for ways to establish synergies, connections, um, contacts, and a sharing of information. Um, Mercy Corps knows a lot about the Middle East um, because a lot of bad things happen out there. I just uh, brokered a phone call between Mercy Corps CEO and the CEO of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband, former British Foreign Secretary, where we're figuring out how we proceed together um, in, in the countries I just mentioned in the Levant, but also in Afghanistan, uh, as we face a very uncertain future there. So that, that would be my last point. Um, uh, in an increasingly uncertain world that we operate collaboratively, uh, that we look around for other organizations that are operating in the same space uh, and share some of the same principles, if not exact goals, and, and, and find a way to harmonize those. Uh, so with that, um, I will um, gratefully give you back to uh, our Texas president, uh, Charles Foster. And again, my deep thanks and appreciation to all of you who serve on the board and in the leadership of this great country, uh, uh, this great institution, and those of you who have made it the reality it is, both here and elsewhere in the country. Thank you. Actually, for is this on? Yeah, for clarification, I was never trying to give him the hook, but uh, <laughs> I think he wanted to get started. I, what I'm going to do is ask a few questions. I think maybe on all of our minds, and then save a lot of time for your questions because that's why you're here. But having most recently served in Afghanistan, and with the uh, announced policy of, of, of President, you served under that all troops will be removed. Uh, from Afghanistan in 2004 and with President Hamid uh, Karzai sort of uh, not being as um, uh, supportive of the U.S. position, maybe for his own internal political reasons, um, and being the home of Joanne Herring King, where she often speaks about where U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan and, and, and 
for bad things happening. What is your prognosis uh, for Afghanistan as we're beginning to pull out, uh, and, and can we expect a semi-stable, uh, a better situation than what happened after, uh, after the uh, Russians pulled out? Uh, it's a critical question. Um, the whole region uh, is central to U.S. national security interests, arguably no place more important than Afghanistan given our history. Um, when I was ambassador there, uh, we worked very hard to do two things. Um, uh, ensure international commitment uh, to finance Afghan national security forces in the out years. Chicago summit, May 2012, uh, produced international pledges led by the U.S. Um, uh, that would sustain a force of 260,000 uh, military and police through the out years. A lesson of the 1980s uh, was that it wasn't the Soviet withdrawal that caused the collapse of the Afghan security forces and the onset of the Civil War. Uh, they fought on uh, for three years after the Soviet withdrawal, 89 to 92. And they more than held their own against the Mujahideen factions. The army fell apart when the funding stopped. Uh, so here's what worries me. Uh, you may have seen in the press the tremendous casualties that um, Afghan forces are taking. Well, it doesn't stop them for a second. Um, you know, they're tough. They're in the fight uh, because they are paid, because they are resourced. Um, because medical evacuation is available to them. Um, if we pull completely, those pledges are gonna collapse, starting with us. Um, and we've seen how that movie ran before. Uh, you know, the adage attributed to the Taliban uh, is that you Americans may have the watches, but we've got the time. Uh, we'll wait out. Um, so we need to we need to get a grip as a country and as an administration. Uh, we need to sit under a tree until we feel a little calmer. Uh, we need to stop making the kinds of pronouncements we have seen out of Washington uh, in recent weeks. We need to just run silent, do whatever we can to ensure that the uh, April election is free and fair to the extent that it uh, meets minimal international standards and most importantly Afghan standards. And we need to understand where President Karzai is coming from. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Shah Shoja? Yeah, you would have been. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, this was the leader the British installed in the 19th century during their first occupation. Um, uh, he was seen as a British puppet, uh, and that is who President Karzai thinks of whenever he's faced with a major decision involving the U.S. Uh, he spoke to me of it many times, uh, and the Taliban used that against him uh, because, after all, we did install him at the end of 2001. Uh, his successor will not labor under that particular challenge. So, you know, he's had the worst job in the world uh, for almost 13 years. Um, let's understand that. Let's quit pounding on him. Let's stop making threats that are going to hurt our own interests. Uh, let's just get through these elections, and then let's proceed with the successor. Because every single one of the, what is it, 11 major candidates have all said, I'm going to sign. Let's let it proceed. All of it, including Russell, will indicate they'll, they'll sign the agreement to allow a, a certain contingent of U.S. forces to remain in, in Afghanistan? Yes, uh, every, every single one. And, and since Russell's likely maybe the favorite, is, will he, in your opinion, be uh, uh, allow for that type of stability that you're talking about? You know, the, the ongoing presence of U.S. troops uh, has a significance well beyond their numbers and mission. Uh, 
you know, the Afghans fight and die because they know we're there. Um, you know, they know we'll do the medevacs in, in cases where they can't do it themselves. And I got to tell you, any of you who have served in the military or served with the military know that a soldier's morale is hugely affected by his or her knowledge that if he or she gets hit, somebody's going to get them to a medical facility and, and, and save their lives. That's what we do. They're not developed to that point yet. They don't have a logistical system uh, that can sustain the full fight. We help with that. Uh, uh, but it's also psychological. I mean, it is a signal to the Afghan military, to the Afghan people, and to Afghanistan's neighbors uh, that we are not going to repeat the 1980s after this. Uh, so it, the, the symbolism of this is absolutely huge. And all the candidates get it. Uh, I, I'm not going to handicap the election, and I probably shouldn't have mentioned my friend, uh, Foreign Minister Rasul. Uh, uh, the, the Afghan press uh, um, has uh, Ashraf Ghani uh, in the lead. That may be a name familiar to some of you, because he served here in this country for years and years as a senior official in the World Bank. Uh, uh, he knows us, he understands us, um, uh, and he was one of the first to say, just give me the agreement and I'll have my signature. Um, another country where you served as U.S. Ambassador in Pakistan, Prime Minister Sharif, uh, there, there's always been some, um, a huge amount of misunderstanding, tension about the Pakistani government, the, the at times the apparent tolerance uh, of uh, Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda affiliate likes in Pakistan, the destabilization of the government. What, what can we ex expect uh, from Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and, and generally the issues that they're confronting there? Uh, Charles, it's a great question because it, it's linked to your earlier question. Um, I've had these conversations with the Pakistanis, both uh, when I was ambassador there and then when I was in Afghanistan and made several visits. Uh, I had some pretty good friends in pretty senior positions, uh, mainly in uniform, and basically what they were saying is about the Taliban presence, because the Taliban leadership, the Afghan Taliban leadership, is largely resident in Pakistan, where they're safe. You can't really get at them. Um, and the response from the people um, I knew was, uh, you think we're hedging our bets here in Pakistan? Hey, you finally figured out something right for a change. You bet we're hedging our bets. Um, because we, we saw what you did in the 80s. Uh, as soon as the Soviets were gone, you Americans pulled pitch, and you were gone too. Um, we didn't have conventional forces, but we had a lot going on in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Um, and on our way out the door, um, we stopped seeking waivers to the Pressler Amendment, um, uh, which stipulated that all economic and military assistance uh, would cease to any country that was involved in a nuclear weapons program. Um, well, we knew that um, Pakistan was involved in a nuclear weapons program, as was India, back to 1974, when then Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto announced it. But it was convenient to us. We needed Pakistan's support against the Soviets. Um, most Americans you know, have no recollection of this. Uh, and it is an Af uh, a Pakistani narrative. I mean, we have our own, the very few know enough about it to develop one. Uh, but boy, Pakistanis remember. So what they are basically saying to us is, you came and you went. You came again, you're going to go again. And certainly statements such that we have seen over the last week or so fuel that suspicion or even conviction. Um, uh, and what they don't want to be left with is a mortal em uh, enemy in the form of the Afghan Taliban. They've got enough problems with their own Taliban. 
uh, with groups like Lashkar-e Taiba, and I can go on and on. Never mind that they created those groups and created those problems. Um, it, it's kind of hard to argue with the logic that says, we're not taking on the Taliban leadership from Afghanistan that's resident in our country because we're going to be left with it and you're going to be gone. Uh, which is why I make the point about the, uh, the symbolic importance uh, of saying to the entire region, we're not going. We're not going. Uh, we are going to maintain a military presence. We are going to maintain uh, a strong level of political and economic engagement in Afghanistan and in the region. Um, it's part of why I'm going to India, by the way. It's, uh, uh, so, you know, that's the message that the Pakistanis need to hear. And it's the only thing that will ever change the strategic calculus in Islamabad. Um, uh, a growing conviction that, whoa, the Americans are doing it different this time. They are not going to disengage. So let's, let's rethink where our interests are, because arguably the presence of groups like the Haqqani Network in uh, North Waziristan, as well as the Quetta Shura, uh, have been factors in uh, directly or indirectly fueling um, the internal security challenges that, that Pakistan faces. They're not having an easy time either. Uh, they're just not sure they've got another alternative. We're in a position to give them one. You've spoken earlier uh, about looking at the region more broadly, including the Middle East, and an issue that continues to come up politically in America, and I've got a feeling it will in 2016, is the attack on Benghazi. And, and, and as a former American ambassador who's been subject, been under siege yourself in, in Damascus and perhaps elsewhere, uh, how, how do you see that? I mean, stripping away the politics, um, uh, about that, how, how did you feel and, and, and where do you come down on that issue now that you're out of government? And meaning I can say any darn thing I want and you're right. hoping I will. <laughs> uh, Chris Stevens was a friend of mine uh, his entire career. Uh, he, he was younger. I, I got to know him as soon as he uh, came into the service and into the Near East Bureau. Uh, where, like me, he spent his entire career, uh, you know, one of my closest friends. And I got that call at 3 a.m. West Coast time saying he was dead. Uh, so it was a huge personal loss to me as well as a loss to the nation. Uh, you can't separate the politics from this. In uh, uh, a long list of undistinguished episodes, the way both parties dealt with the assassination of Chris Stevens, frankly, I thought appalling. Because uh, here's the deal. Um, I was a career foreign service officer. When we're sworn in, raise our right hands, and we repeat the same oath that our brothers and sisters who wear the uniform repeat to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. There is no provision in there that says, but only, only in the restaurants of Paris or the cafes of Brussels. Um, uh, you know, we are sworn to use our best efforts wherever they are needed, and often those are in the world's hardest places. What goes along with that is, you're going to lose people. If you're doing diplomacy right, uh, you're going to be engaged in a way where you're running risks. Um, uh, those risks have to be managed. They have to be controlled. They require good judgment. Uh, but if you go to zero risk, you go to zero effectiveness. And that is where I think this whole Benghazi debate is starting to push us. And it, it you know, I made the point about Chris being a personal friend and a personal loss to underscore the point uh, that no one would be more appalled about where this debate has gone than he would have been. Uh, uh, you know, I served Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Lebanon during the Civil War. Uh, 
all the Foreign Service officers I served with knew the risk they were running and were prepared to do it because they knew our national interests were at stake. Um, uh, it, it has been said that the best ambassador is 100,000 tons of aircraft carrier. That's not quite right. Uh, the best ambassador is the ambassador who knows how to use 100,000 tons of aircraft carrier uh, to achieve political and diplomatic objectives. But you can only do that if you're on the ground uh, and you're part of the fight. And sometimes that fight is going to get literal and the bullets are real. And we as a society, as a Congress, and as an administration need to understand that while we do everything we can to protect our diplomats, if they're doing their jobs right from time to time, we're going to lose one. It's sad, but if we're not prepared to accept that, then we're crippling our own diplomacy. And a couple of dozen diplomats who know the language, culture, history, politics, uh, and are taking managed risk might save you an entire division or more of soldiers later. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to all of you, because I think uh, Ambassador Crocker has probably stirred a lot of other uh, questions. But this is a, a softball question. As, as dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service, just a word or two about that and the role uh, that important school plays. I wish it was here in Houston, but it's up at A&M. God's country. Uh, you know, there, there were a lot of things I could have done when I uh, tried to retire the first time uh, after Iraq. Uh, I was invited down to give a, uh, a lecture and had dinner with uh, President Bush and uh, this was 2009. Um, and just talking to him reminded me, I was his ambassador to Lebanon. I, I go back that far. Uh, you know, that we have never had a president who was more experienced and more distinguished in foreign affairs than George H.W. Bush at a more critical time. That was the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. It was the collapse of the East Bloc, the fall of the wall, Germany reunif reunification, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. They were all handled brilliantly uh, by the president and that distinguished team, one of whom lives in this town, Jim Baker, uh, that he had around him. Uh, then I met with the students. The Bush School is unique. Um, we, we don't have undergraduates. Um, and we don't have a PhD program. Uh, we are a school of government and public service, not public policy, not public affairs, but public service. Uh, students come to us because they know who they are. God bless their undergraduate faculty who help them find themselves. We don't have to do it. Um, they know where they want to go. They want to serve their communities, their state, and their country. Uh, and are looking for the tools to be able to do that. And I have found it enormously satisfying uh, to be a part of, of giving them that experience. Uh, I don't think there is any other school of government and public service in the country that has a higher percentage of its graduates who go into the Foreign Service, the CIA, other federal agencies. Uh, they're committed to it. You know, and in that, they follow the vision of uh, the 41st president who uh, described public service as a noble calling and, and lived it uh, and still lives it uh, his entire life. So for me, it was a chance of, after almost four decades of, of service, to have a role in preparing the next generation of Americans who are going to carry this country forward, uh, either in um, state and local government or in the international arena. Um, I'm not an academic, I'm a practitioner. Uh, I'm one of the very few non-academic deans you're gonna find anywhere in this country. But it demonstrates the focus of the school uh, to, to prepare Americans to carry on the tradition of public service as a noble calling and to have the skills necessary to carry it out well. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that has meant the world to me. I, I had an offer 
um, uh, early last spring to, uh, to stay at Yale, uh, uh, where I was teaching. Uh, with absolutely no offense to any Yaleys in the crowd, uh, it's a great university. Uh, it, it took me exactly four seconds to consider the offer. Uh, uh, you know, I was coming home to A&M and the Bush School because we've, you know, we've got the standards and the principles of service to the nation. Um, that is an Aggie tradition. And no offense to any of you who might have gone to the University of Texas either. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, there is something special about A&M, there's something special about the Bush School. I often tell my, my uh, yeah. I'm a proud Longhorn, UT Longhorn, but I, I spend more time up at, I think, the Bush School because of the school <laughs> and the library than I go back to Austin. Well, with that, uh, let's open up the questions. Thomas Riley, who's the director of our programming, has a mic, and please identify yourself if you've got a question. Henrietta has, let's get, uh, Henrietta's got a question. Uh, let's let her start. So thank you very much. So Ryan, um, would you talk about two areas? One is um, either because of being an English major or maybe in spite of being an English major, you have studied uh, the values of other societies and you've lived in many Muslim communities. And do you have some thoughts on what you think all of us should know that you learned working in the societies that you think would be good for Asia society to be bringing out, focusing on, building bridges? And the second is, would you talk about the trail of money? Narcotics, Iran, how the financing of terrorism and groups in the many countries you've worked in is moving in the world today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Henrietta. Again, a couple of, of, um, of, of great questions. Uh, on the first, more of what you are already doing. I, I, I so wish I could have attended that uh, exhibition of Muslim culture uh, that you did in New York. Um, and as I said in my comments, I mean, most Americans aren't aware that Muslims have a culture. Uh, well, uh, you know, they do, and I, I found that, uh, as I said, a very strong poetic tradition. Um, you know, if the Asia Society can do anything further uh, to bring great works of Islamic literature into the English language uh, and make them accessible to Americans, um, uh, that would be tremendous. Um, uh, to foster the study of, of Arabic and other regional languages. Uh, you know, I know you do a great deal on education um, and on East Asian languages. Um, you know, I, I had a few tricks as ambassador, <coughs> excuse me, um, and one of them was taking the time to memorize um, stanzas from Arabic poetry, including pre-Islamic. And, you know, when any appropriate moment came in a conversation, my ability to recite, even in a bad accent, uh, you know, something that is cherished uh, by Muslims, uh, you know, generally got the conversation into a better place than it had before. Um, the other thing is, anything you can do to educate Americans about what Islam is, what are its tenets? Um, you know, the very name, the very word Islam, as many of you know, comes from Salam, peace. Uh, it is the third religion of the book after Judaism and Christianity. Uh, and you know, when you read the Quran, uh, and there's a reference to Jesus, it is followed by peace be upon him because he is seen as a prophet. Um, uh, that most Muslims, the huge majority of Muslims, are as appalled by the violence that racks the area as any of us. Um, and you can have an interesting debate over, you know, what the colonial legacy contributed uh, to the situation we face today and what some of our own policies did. Um, 
but it, it's to stop the demonization of, of Arabs uh, and, and of Muslims. Um, and it shouldn't be that hard to do uh, because their history, both ancient and modern, uh, does an awful lot to dispel that. Uh, you know, here's a little known factoid. Um, uh, far more Pakistani soldiers have died in the tribal areas of Pakistan fighting militants than either Afghan or coalition soldiers combined on the other side of the border. Um, uh, they know they're in the fight of their lives. Uh, and why is it such a fight? That's your second question. Um, the uh, Afghan narcotics trade uh, uh, is huge. Uh, and we haven't done such a great job in figuring out a policy to get under control. Um, and uh, it is not the wolf closest to the sled uh, for the Karzai government, uh, even though Karzai himself is uh, in no way implicated in this. Um, uh, where does it go and who does it benefit? It certainly benefits the Taliban. Uh, uh, derivatively, it benefits Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda central, it's heavily franchised. I'm talking about Al-Qaeda in the Pakistan border area. Um, who are its victims? Uh, the Europeans, because that's where most of it winds up, the streets of, Ambas of Amsterdam or London or Berlin. Um, uh, and this might surprise many Americans. Uh, perhaps the largest victim in every sense is Iran. Um, uh, the uh, opium and heroin addiction rate in Iran is enormous. Um, and the number of Af of Iranian security forces who get killed uh, each year trying to interdict this trade coming out of Afghanistan or through the Baluchistan Loop um, south through Pakistan uh, is in the thousands. Um, I've often thought that, uh, gee, if we want to talk to the uh, Iranians about other issues uh, in addition to the nuclear question, well, that would be a good one. You know, how can we work together and bring in others to combat a drug trade uh, that um, doesn't hurt us that much directly except for our forces in Afghanistan. It, it doesn't reach our shores. Uh, but how we can bring the Europeans into a more active role uh, because it is a huge source of um, funding for criminal and terrorist activities. All of that said, um, uh, as far as I know or knew, Al-Qaeda gets most of its money uh, not through the drug trade. The Taliban is a little stingy with that. They, they do get some, uh, but most of it comes um, in suitcases from couriers out of the Gulf, uh, suitcases filled with cash that um, are provided by not governments, but private citizens of these countries who sympathize with their cause. Good. Thank you. Hello? Hi. I, I have a question I've been wanting to know for a decade. Um, we in the United States forget that we have been a nation state for over two centuries. And we forget that Italy was still forming in the 1870s, Germany was forming in the 1870s, and, and ironically, we're dealing with these people in the Middle East and to some extent in Europe and very much in Asia who don't identify themselves as nation states. And so I, I've always wondered, are we dealing with a, an odd concept because we're dealing with nation state, a very World War II concept, people who don't identify with that and we don't know how to handle that? Uh, that's a, it's a very... Very interesting question. Um, many states of the Middle East, of course, um, and the broader Middle East, you know, you go all the way through Pakistan, uh, have artificial borders in the sense that they were drawn by people who were not indigenous of the region. Uh, they were drawn by colonial occupiers. Um, 
So I guess the interesting thing is how well these um, artificially bordered states have hung together. Um, uh, Iraq and Iran fought a vicious eight-year war um, that we, we really haven't seen since World War I. Uh, and the veterans of that war would be like a, a young British or French or German officer in World War I who went through it all, not just from 14 to 18, but twice over, eight years instead of four. Um, Iraqis died by the tens of thousands defending a, effectively uh, a state that was created for them but not by them, uh, yet they were ready to do so. Uh, and even today, uh, Arab Sunnis and Arab Shias, whatever other uh, schisms may exist between them, uh, are very proud Iraqis. Kurds are a slight exception. Um, although the Kurds have, uh, I think, come to appreciate that their interests lie in a unitary Iraqi state. Um, you know, conversations I used to have with the Kurdish leadership were along the lines of, uh, tell me what the worst of times were for you. And there'd be a debate over that. Generally, they settled on the uh, so-called onfall campaign uh, of the late 1980s that led to the gassing of Halabcha and the death in one day of over 5,000 Kurdish civilians. Uh, but there'd be some back and forth because the Kurds have had a long, bloody history. Um, but then I'd ask him, tell me what the best of times was. And that was easy. I said, oh yeah, now. I mean, whoa, we've never had it so good. And my response to that would be, good, don't blow it. Don't overreach. Um, you know, don't try to separate completely from the rest of Iraq because you're just going to bring hell down on you. Um, and, you know, so far, so good. Now, <laughs> What's going to happen with the Arab Spring? Um, some of these artificial divisions may split apart. Watch out for Syria. Watch out for Libya. Uh, uh, those would be the two I'd be most worried about. Hope that it doesn't happen Iran, in Iran where Persians are a minority of the population. Uh, and I certainly hope nobody in Washington thinks it would be a great idea to start um, agitating Azerbaijanis or Iranian Kurds or Iranian Baluchis or other minorities. Uh, uh, you know, we have an interest in the preservation of these unitary states. Uh, anything else is simply going to bring uh, more instability. Um, uh, like I said, I worry about Iran, I worry about uh, Libya, and Lord knows what's going to happen in Syria. Um, uh, but that, those divisions are not in our interest, and those populations, by and large, don't incline in that direction. Uh, they were handed an artificial structure, uh, again, by colonial powers, but the extent to which they have embraced those borders, to me, is pretty amazing, and we should continue to help them to do so. Ambassador Crocker, thank you for tonight. Would you please point out to us whom you read or hear in the media and you think that person gets it? Could you name one or a few people? Thank you. Okay, that's the hardest question of the night. Um, Um, Anthony Shadid got it. Anthony Shadid wrote for the New York Times, um, Lebanese American, fluent Arabic speaker. Um, he died trying to get the story right in Syria, uh, crossing from Turkey into Syria on the back of a horse without realizing he had a fatal allergy to horse hair. Um, uh, but, but Anthony Shadid got it. 
uh, Dexter Filkins, who writes for the New Yorker. Uh, he gets it. Uh, Ned Parker, who writes for the Los Angeles Times, gets it. Uh, Robin Wright, who has left the Washington Post, gets it. Um, in um, electronic media, uh, since you only get three minutes of airtime, it's hard to tell. Uh, but, you know, I, I think Fareed Zakaria gets it um, uh, on, on CNN. Um, and there are, there are others out there. Uh, Peter Baker, also New York Times, gets it. Um, uh, Gina Chan, who um, was fired from the Wall Street Journal over a pitiful scandal. Uh, I hope to see her back in mainstream journalism, because she certainly got it. Um, so that's, that's kind of my short list. You know, with, with, uh, with more time, I, I could add others. Um, uh, but generally speaking, I find them in print journalism more, more than I do in the electronic media. I'll give you two others that might surprise you that are in the electronic media. Uh, one of them is uh, Abdurrahim Fukhara. Uh, he is the Al Jazeera Washington bureau chief. Um, he also previously worked for BBC and for NPR. He gets it from a Middle Eastern perspective, but he is also fully conversant uh, uh, in, in our idiom and our understanding. Um, and his rival and competitor, competitor uh, Hisham Milham, who is the U.S. Bureau Chief for El Arabiya, the, the Saudi network that was set up in opposition to Al Jazeera. Uh, I had them both on a panel up in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and they're personal friends, and uh, their, their insights were, were just uh, absolutely amazing. And I talked to several of you tonight. Uh, if you really want to get a good media take on what's going on in the Middle East, Al Jazeera English. It doesn't have the editorial slant that uh, uh, damages their Arabic service because they're trying to cultivate an American audience, but they are able to draw on all those Al Jazeera bureaus all over the Middle East um, and are increasingly professional. It's a sad thing to say, but uh, Again, for, for the broader Middle East, um, in my view, the best electronic media outlet um, is based in Qatar. Ambassador, um, two questions, uh, both about uh, Pakistan. First, uh, it appears to me that in the last several years, an increasing amount of political maturity developing. Uh, based, I'm, I'm basing that on their ability to transfer power peacefully. Uh, and it's, uh, what's perhaps a little surprising about that is it's the same players who managed to display a level of maturity that perhaps in the past they didn't. I'd like your views on that. The second thing allied to that is that, uh, as you know, Imran Khan, who's one of their uh, political leaders there, you know, he goes kind of sort of hot and cold, because at times, to a Western audience anyway, he can speak with an amazing amount of logic that people can relate to, and very inspirational at times. And at other times, he looks like he's like, you know, I don't know what he's talking about. So, uh, you know, your views on both of those topics would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, th th those are great questions, and um, uh, I, I would agree with your, your first point. Um, you know, there is a rising level of political maturity. At, it shows that even politicians can actually learn over time. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I think Nawaz, Nawaz Sharif learned from his previous experience as prime minister that did not go extremely well for him. Um, uh, so you're, you're seeing a, a more measured approach uh, led by the prime minister uh, uh, that I find encouraging and the fact, as you point out, that uh, for the first time in Pakistan's history, uh, we have seen a peaceful constitutional change of power. Um, uh, it is no small thing. 
I, I, I do have some worries. Um, one of them is, uh, given the deeply personal animosity between Nawaz Sharif and Parvez Musharraf, um, uh, that Sharif will pursue a prosecution that may be seen by senior military officers as an attack not just on Musharraf, but on the army as an institution, and that can be very dangerous. I, I hope the Prime Minister will do unto Musharraf as Musharraf did unto him uh, when he deposed him at the end of the 90s, which is let him go. Just let him, let him go back into exile. Uh, you know, with, um, with Imran Khan, uh, someone I, I personally like, uh, uh, probably a good poster boy for why sports superstars uh, should not um, aspire to political careers. <laughs> uh, Imran Khan, as I think most of you know, was one of the greatest uh, men ever to play the game of cricket. Um, but he is smart. Uh, he is well educated. He does understand the world, and uh, you know I think he's got a choice to make. Uh, his populism is, of course, what gave his party uh, control of Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa, uh, previously known as Northwest Territories. Um, uh, He's going to have to decide if he wants to go farther. Does he stick with that brand of populism, uh, which can be pretty destructive, or does he rise to a higher level? Uh, what we saw, I think, last week, uh, when he said, "No, we're not going to block uh, convoys uh, for NATO forces into Afghanistan anymore. That's over. We're not going to do it." Um, uh, I, I hope that's an encouraging initial sign that he is going to start moving uh, like Nawaz Sharif in a more mature direction. But, uh, you know, Pakistan has huge internal problems that go back to partition. Uh, issues of the Punjab and Kashmir. I mean, there are four provinces in Pakistan. Two of them didn't want anything to do with the Pakistani state. Um, uh, so, you know, we can be pretty quick to criticize uh, Pakistan, and, and there's a lot to be critical of, but, you know, we, we, we need to understand uh, uh, that they face enormous internal challenges, not all of them of their creation. Um, uh, you know, and India's got the other half of that, uh, where things are not as easy there as they might be. Um, we'll see what happens in the April slash May elections. Uh, and, and going back to the earlier question about uh, the U.S., it, it helps to bear in mind uh, that it took us 13 years after the Declaration of, Inst of uh, Independence to come up with a constitution. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, after we tried the Articles of Confederation, uh, that didn't turn out to be such a good idea. And even when we did the Constitution, we papered over a lot of the really big issues uh, that tore the country apart seven decades later. Um, and, you know, our founding fathers were pretty similar to each other. They were all white guys. Uh, they all came to the United States because they wanted to be free and escape persecution. Uh, but they couldn't deal with the issues of states' rights and slavery, uh, the rights of women, the rights of Native Americans. Um, and several of those issues led to our Civil War, the bloodiest conflict we've ever waged. Uh, so when we decide we're going to be impatient with Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, you know, for not getting it right, right away, it helps to show a little humility and reflect on our own history. Just a personal thought. I think we're really at the end, but let's end. Uh, Josette, I know you had a question. Uh, or Tom, Josette? Well, Josette. I'm not Josette, but I do have a question. Josette, do you want to go? <laughs> we all... <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make it brief. Ambassador Crocker, uh, just something that I think is... Uh, 
Uh, if the reports are right, current right now, and if you can imagine yourself as an ambassador back in any of the countries you mentioned, uh, they apparently underway in the national security and establishment about whether it is okay to conduct a drone strike or in other ways go after a guy uh, in the region who has conducted allegedly attacks against Americans, uh, fomented terrorism, uh, happens to be an American citizen. Now, I know this has happened with Germany lucky some years ago, uh, but if you're an ambassador in the region, first of all, I'm curious to know what you think of it, but if you're an ambassador, a U.S. ambassador in the region, and you have to explain why it's okay for the United States, whatever you think of the drone policy, to go after Afghan citizens or Pakistani citizens, but there needs to be a big, broad debate in this country about whether it's okay to do the same thing to an American who is alleged to be doing the same thing. Oh, well, thank you, Tom, for that question. Now I have a chance to just piss everybody off uh, So I'll, here at the end of the evening, so I'm going to take it. Uh, uh, you know, again, I served in Afghanistan. I served in Pakistan um, uh, during a period when drone strikes uh, were part of our policy. Uh, they have increased exponentially um, under the current administration. Uh, when I was in Pakistan, we um, sought the permission of the Pakistani government uh, for every single drone strike. We, we moved away from that policy, which I think is unfortunate. Most of the times they'd approve it, uh, but sometimes Musharraf or his intelligence chief would come back and say, oh boy, this, uh, this baby ain't worth it because because of this individual's tribal affiliations, who he's connected with, who the people he's connected with are connected to, uh, you're going to create a worse situation uh, than you're attempting to solve by taking them off the, uh, uh, the street through a lethal action. And, you know, generally speaking, they were right. I mean, we just had to be judicious. Uh, with respect to um, uh, strikes on American citizens, uh, yeah, I got to tell you, you know, I, maybe I've just been in the fight too darn long. I don't care what nationality uh, an individual carries. Uh, if, if he's killing my countrymen, I'm going to kill him if I can. Um, and the case under current debate, or Alaki, these are not the first. Um, there's a guy named Adam Gadan. Tom, you will have heard of him because of your profession. Adam Gadon is a Californian. Uh, he is of Polish extraction. Uh, no Middle Eastern background whatsoever. Uh, in his university years, um, he came to embrace uh, a militant anti-Americanism uh, and is now ensconced in the tribal areas of Pakistan as Al-Qaeda's chief of communications. Um, Back in my day, we had a lethal finding against him, um, meaning that if we could find him and the Pakistanis approved, we'd kill him. Um, still haven't found him, but one day we will. Uh, and, you know, we are right to have a debate on this issue. I mean, that's who we are as Americans. Uh, is extrajudicial killing of an American citizen something we want to tolerate? But, Tom, you bring up a very important point. Then let's broaden the debate. Uh, you know, what about individuals of other nationalities? Again, I'll tell you where I come down, kill them all. There are some people who just need killing. Uh, uh, it's, it's a war. You know, I... I you know, we talked about Chris Stevens. Uh, when I left Afghanistan, there was a young woman on her second tour who handled all my press stuff. Um, two months later, she um, was killed in a convoy that rolled over an improvised explosive device. Yeah, well, I want payback. Um, if they were going to kill us, you know, damn it, I want to... The military has the phrase, the three F's, and before you panic, um, find, fix, finish. 
I'm all for it. Well, on that very sober note, we want to thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Parker, on behalf of us all, we want to thank you for your, your public service to the United States, uh, to the people of, of America, and we're pleased you're continuing that with the Bush School, and we look forward to having you speak on further occasions. And on, on behalf of all of us, we want to present you with this very modest token of our appreciation. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Bonna, our, uh, the Texas Center, I want to thank you all for coming. We look forward to our programming tomorrow. Uh, uh, let's see, in terms of our first panel, it's at 10.30 in the morning. It's going to be outstanding. We hope you're there. Uh, I want to, again, single out Nancy Allen uh, for her uh, generosity and leadership in, in so many areas, but particularly for uh, her support in putting together this wonderful gift you have with you, a book that shows photographs from our dedication and the history of this beautiful building. So, uh, again... Thank you, Ambassador Crocker. Thanks, Nancy. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs>